list of rules. Where did that come from? Kiss goodnight, sing jock jams, Brahms eats with the family. Oh, Brahms is back, oh, baby! Jeez, you spooked me, man. Well, if it isn't Brahms, my favorite little doll with a little bow tie too, how about that? Pretty dapper, I know, yes. So you actually expect me to follow all these rules, huh? Well, I can tell you one thing, I am not giving you a kiss goodnight. That's for dead gumsher. Oh, come on. No kisses. Just one kiss. Mm. No way. And besides, I thought it was the guy doing the whole thing, not the doll. What's going on here? No, 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 no. I was behind the evil the whole time. Ha <laughs> yes. But that makes literally no sense based on how the first movie ended. You realize? Too bad. I'm in charge now. Plus, I got all kinds of cool new powers. Oh, yeah. Like what? Hey, what the hell? Hmm? My chibis. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explain, we're looking at the return of the well-dressed doll Brahms in Brahms the Boy 2, where a few years after a man was discovered living in the walls of Hulshire Manor, an unknowing young family moves onto the grounds. And terror strikes when the boy finds the creepy doll called Brahms buried in the yard. Sorry, I was just trying to say Brahms as much as possible there, mainly because the title of the sequel is a bit strange, Brahms the Boy 2. Like, who are they trying to appeal to? Die-hard fans of the doll or something? Why not just call it the boy too? I have no idea. But then again, I ain't one of those Hollywood big shots making decisions like that. I still stand by my suggested title for the sequel for my vid for the last movie, The Boy 2, Growing Up is Hard to Do. Even stranger than the clunky title is if you were actually really into the first one, the sequel kind of undoes a lot of the first movie completely. All in order to squeeze a sequel out of their creepy doll, continuity be damned. It made me think it was maybe different people than made the first, but nope, same writer and director. So even they don't really care about their own movie, I guess, because probably the most interesting or memorable takeaway from the first film was its genuinely surprising late runtime twist. Much of the story is all about the creepy Brahms doll terrorizing the nanny Lauren Cohen, but we come to learn it wasn't the doll that was evil or moving around on its own, but was being manipulated by the long thought Paris son Brahms of the Heelshire family. Again, the doll is just a doll, not any supernatural stuff going on at all. Bizarrely, The Boy 2 tosses this entire aspect by the wayside, as it now is the doll that is containing some kind of malevolent supernatural entity, and it is actually behind all the evil. Pretty huge retcon of the first, and it's like they just had to change a bunch of stuff to even make the sequel exist at all. The first one wasn't even that good in the first place, so I wasn't really expecting much to be honest. Regardless of my feelings, there's a whole new Brahms adventure to look at. So we'll be breaking down the story, all of what we learn is now true about the doll, and explaining the ending that boldly sets things to continue into another sequel. Let's first do a recap of what went down at the first movie before picking up with our new family of victims. As mentioned, our nanny Greta was hired by the Heelshire family to tend to the Brahms doll, a kind of proxy for their supposedly dead son which they named the doll after. Eventually learning the human Brahms has been living inside of the walls of his parents' house for 20 years and is now a twisted and deranged killer who has a room and elaborate crawl spaces to move around the house without detection, which Greta and her new boyfriend Malcolm stumble upon. They encounter Brahms wearing a porcelain mask like the dolls, and when Malcolm gets the crap beaten out of him, she tries a different tactic, appealing to Brahms' long-held desire to be part of a normal family, acting as his mother and putting him to bed for his violent actions. He flips and tries to kill her, Greta getting him in the gut with a screwdriver, scooping up the injured Malcolm and fleeing the grounds. Now I was incorrect back in my upcoming 2020 video because I really thought the mansion burned down at the end, but it is still very much still standing and our killer pal Brahms is alive and well. The final scene being back inside the mansion, a hand scene placing an eye back into the doll's socket, having reassembled the destroyed Brahms. Where we leave things off, our killer is very much alive as well as that pesky doll, but we don't find out too much in regard to any of this as we jump forward 
forward a few years after these events to a new family that crosses paths with the doll. The opening scene sets the stage for some real trauma for our family. Following Liza coming home and her prank-loving, upbeat son Jude messing around with her for his amusement. Their carefree camaraderie is invaded by a masked burglar that attacks Liza, and she definitely fights back and kicks the dude's ass. Way to go, lady! All being watched by a terrified Jude. This encounter leads to lingering psychological effects for the mother and son. Liza plagued by nightmares of the robber every night, and little Jude's anxiety has manifested in selective mutism, not speaking a word and only communicating via a notepad, and constantly clutching a teddy bear his mom gave him for comfort, which before this incident felt that he was too old for. Showing us this kid is dealing with some major issues, his parents finding themselves at a loss of what to do, until Dad Sean comes up with a possible solution, to get out of the big city and go stay in a country house for a while, hopeful it will help them to relax and potentially get their family back to a better place. The actual home they're renting is in fact a former guest house of the nearby abandoned Hillshire mansion where our first Brahms adventure occurred. But of course, the family has no idea what happened in their new home. I mean, you'd think that's the kind of thing they'd have on Airbnb. Nice location, good atmosphere, and oh yeah, right next to the house where the dude was living in the walls for decades. Three stars. And wouldn't you know it, when Jude and Liza go for a walk of the grounds, they stumble across the old Hillshire mansion, which appeared to be in the process of being turned into some kind of hotel until the new owner simply gave up. Nearby, Jude spots something odd sticking out of the ground, a little doll hand reaching out of the dirt to say hello. They unearth our favorite porcelain boy, Brahms, and Jude is instantly smitten, although poor Brahms has seen better days, all scuffed and dirty after being buried for some time. Mom gives him the old spit and shine, and boom, the doll is good as new. Also noticing based on some little fractures that the doll has been put back together again at some point, which we know all about. Jude and his pal are on the fast track to becoming besties, which seems innocent enough at first. That is until it seems there's more than meets the eye to their little visitor, which Jude tells them is called Brahms, and they're like, that's a weird name to come up with, but he informs them that it was actually the doll who told Jude his name, and they're like, okay, sure kid, you're talking to the doll. Now this is only the beginning of something being off about the doll. Liza having several strange encounters that make it seem like the doll is alive and able to move on its own, which is again a huge departure from the first film. Anytime that it appeared the doll moved, it was actually due to Brahms living in the walls moving him around. But his behavior seen here, like his eyes moving on his own, or even somehow changing his little dapper outfits, indicate the doll is much more mobile than we would have expected from the first movie. The parents continue to brush off the strangeness, even as the doll becomes more demanding, reaching a breaking point when Jude, courtesy of Brahms, sets a detailed list of rules he wants the family to follow, which is more than enough for Liza, and they decide to get rid of the doll, exclaiming the doll doesn't make the rules around here, they do, which was probably my favorite scene in the entire movie. The doll is literally tearing this family apart, it's really funny to me for some reason. They're on a warpath to take Brahms away, but Liza is stopped in her tracks outside her son's door, hearing him actually talking to the doll, the first time they've heard him talk since the robbery, but as soon as they enter the room, he's mute again, back to communicating exclusively via his notepad. Regardless, his parents are thrilled with this breakthrough and decide the doll will be staying after all. Speaking with his therapist, he finds it a totally acceptable form of therapy, the doll helping him to control his anxiety and acting as a friend in his time of need. Their connection grows in intensity, taking things eventually to a darker, more frightening direction. It seems the evil doll is influencing the boy's behavior or beginning to possess him in a way, growing in strength as their bond grows stronger as well. They do make it clear that the reason Jude is so adamant to follow what Brahm says is out of fear rather than him wanting to do what the doll wants him to. He's actually worried about what will happen if they don't follow the rules. The whole thing with the rules, as we saw in the first film, although now it's the doll responsible for them instead of a wall-dwelling nutjob, is that Brahms isn't actually that demanding, really. Asking for simple things like a kiss goodnight or eating meals with his family. You know, as long as you keep him happy and treat him like a proper member of the family, there's really nothing to worry about. It's only when breaking the rules that the doll turns violent. Like when some family comes to visit and the little shit cousin starts manhandling the doll, resulting in him having an accident and getting impaled on a broken croquet mallet. Just gotta respect the doll or pay the price. Things soon take another violent turn when meeting the groundskeeper Joseph, who is always just wandering around the woods with a 12 gauge draped on his arm with his dog, doesn't do much in the way of actual groundskeeping that we ever see. He asks the boy the doll's name 
and when telling him Brahms, Joe has a knowing look across his face, responding, of course it is. A not exactly subtle way of showing us that he knows more than he's letting on about what's going on here. His dog also seems to sense something wrong with the doll, initially barking when seeing him and standing guard outside the house. And the doll isn't a fan of the problematic pooch either, wanting it gone. And of course, his pooch does go missing and inevitably is found later dead in the woods, seemingly at the hand of Brahms, or potentially a possessed Jude. All this made more alarming when Liza flips through his notebook, finding several disturbing drawings inside, including what looks like the dead dog and a horrifying future of Jude wearing a mask like the dolls brandishing a gun, the bodies of his parents on the ground. Well, that's not good. Sure looks like Brahms wants to make sure he and his new friend are together forever without any pushy parents getting in the way. Liza attempts to look into the origin of the doll, finding a model number stamped on his foot, but gets no results in the super doll database. During this moment, I was like, maybe try turning it over, lady? I don't know, which she does do about 30 minutes later or something. This time learning of the surprisingly long history tied to Brahms, going back hundreds of years, which is again completely at odds with the first movie. The whole reason he was called Brahms is that he was the name of the kid who grew up in the walls. He accidentally killed a girl, and so his parents pretended he died, getting the doll specifically made as a proxy for their murderous son. Not some random old doll that also happened to be called Brahms. Ah, well, looks like they've changed their minds, even if it doesn't fit their own continuity. Sure, whatever. Who cares? There's more illogical twists and turns still to come. Joe revealing that the Brahms doll is in fact host to a malevolent entity that has been tearing families apart for centuries, being passed from family to family over the years. Each time a child adopts a doll, it influences them to kill, blaming the actions, of course, on the doll. The human Brahms was one of its previous victims, leading to him killing the young girl. And even Joe is a victim of his as well, even now, decades later, still doing the doll's bidding. Indeed, everything that has unfolded has been due to Brahms' manipulation, Joe admitting that he knew that Jude would be coming. And apparently the doll has a kind of ability to find people that need him and draw them to him. Man, his powers are sure getting confusing at this point. Even more so when they head to the mansion and Joe gets launched against a wall with his mind powers. I'm like, whoa, can this doll just do whatever the heck it wants now? Getting out of hand. The final showdown occurs in the Heelshire's basement, where Jude is about to make his own murderous prophecy come to fruition, wearing a doll mask and suit, wielding a shotgun about to take out his mom. Sean manages to sneak up unnoticed, bashing the doll's head in. And when shattered, rather than being empty, underneath is a fleshy monstrosity, an icky, malevolent thing living inside of the porcelain shell. They toss it into the fire of a furnace, destroying the doll, and when removing Jude's mask, he seems to kind of snap out of his state, making it appear that Brahms had taken total control over his body, and now the boy is back to normal. Even though this experience in the countryside was probably six billion times more traumatic than their random break-in, apparently the family has moved on from their past troubles and decide to head back to their old home in London, and everything seems a-okay for some reason. But in our final twist, we learn that that's not the case. Alone in his room, Jude puts on his porcelain Brahms mask, peering into his reflection in the mirror, feeling Brahms will be happy in his new home just as long as Jude's parents remember to follow those ever-important rules. As Joe mentioned earlier, Brahms' actual intent was to become one with the boy, and it looks like he got his wish in the end. Evil dolls are always wanting bodies in movies, it's a given. Also, Brahm seems to have gotten what he always wanted, a family of his own. This obviously leaves things wide open for the boys series to continue with Little Jude possessed by Brahms, which would reinvent the series again and might not actually be a bad direction to go if they have to make a dang sequel. This must be the reason for all the retconning going on in the sequel. At the end of the first one, everything was pretty much done and the doll was only a doll, not much left to work with. So why not make it so the doll is actually behind all the evil and has been doing it for hundreds of years apparently, it immediately does add a lot more to the story than we would have suspected, even if it does not quite fit in with what the first one established. Not that they really needed to make a sequel in the first place, they could have just left it alone, but come on, it's Hollywood. If anything even has a little bit of a success, they're gonna wring that bad boy dry. And Brahms the Boy too shows that it's already long overstayed its welcome, just let Brahms rest in peace 
please. This brings us to the conclusion of this inning explained for the boy too. That was a pretty toothless PG-13 with no real scares or terror throughout, relying on the cheapest of gags to get by. Although it had some glimmers of something more ridiculous bubbling under the surface, which would have made this a lot more entertaining. Because even at a brisk 86 minutes, this one wasn't exactly a pleasure to sit through. What did you guys think of Brahms the Boy 2 and its ending? Are you hopeful that they'll continue the story in more sequels? How do you feel about them pretty much undoing the entire first movie? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.